Let's talk a little bit more about the idea of confounding. So I'm going to abbreviate often C-O-N-F-D, just to make the writing a bit shorter. Now, here's kind of the classic diagram for what a confounder looks like. X1 being our variable of interest, X2 being the confounder. So some, some important points. The first thing to note is that confounding, it only exists in effect size models, not in predictive models. Right? So what confounding means, and we'll write this down in a moment, is if, say, the effect of X1 and X2 are stuck together, okay, and we, need, we want to be able to separate them, but at the moment they're not, that the effect of X1 and X2 are confounded or stuck together. Okay, so if we're building a predictive model, and if our goal is to use some data to try and predict the outcome, it doesn't really make sense to say, you know, the effect of variable x1 and variable x2 are stuck together if we're not interpreting variables' effects. Um, a second note is that confounding is in reference to the variable of interest. So, for example, what we're going to start to look at is, is the effect of smoking on the lung capacity confounded with age? If we were to look at a different variable of interest, say sex, right? What's the effect of biological sex on FEV? Right? Is there a difference in mean lung capacity for males and females? Age may not be a confounder of the sex effect, but it may be a confounder of the smoking effect. Right? So that's what I mean by saying that confounding is in reference to a variable of interest. A variable is not universally a confounder. We want to look at is it confounding a particular variable? So this is kind of the classic diagram of what confounding looks like. So first let me write down some of the criteria for confounders. So the first and the most important is that it makes sense conceptually. So what I mean is that this diagram, thinking of the variable as a confounder, makes sense based on our understanding of the data, not relying just on numerically what is happening. We'll also look at numeric indicators for confounding. So the, um, the variable we're going to look at, or our question of interest that we're building up to, is looking at the effect of smoking on the lung capacity. <coughs> and a potential confounder is going to be age. Okay. So first we want to think of conceptually, <coughs> does this diagram make sense? Well, what effect does smoking have on FEV? I guess first I'll label that, that's our question of interest, right? We want to estimate how does the mean FEV compare for smokers and non-smokers? Does it make sense that age is related to smoking? Does it make sense that age is related to FEV? Okay. Let me write down a few more things and we'll come back to this diagram. So what we want to see is that X2 has some influence over Y, the outcome. So does it make sense conceptually that age has some influence over FEV or the lung capacity? Right, I'd say in this data set, it does make sense conceptually. Right, these are children age 3 up to 19. So as the age increases, the lung capacity increases. Right? That makes sense, and this direction of association makes sense. It's the age affecting the lung capacity. So does that make sense conceptually? And we can also check numerically in the data set, are age and FEV associated? But I want to make the reminder, the concepts, making sense conceptually, is more important than what's going on um, just purely numerically. If we didn't really know much about the concepts, if it was a very kind of new area of research, we might have to rely a bit more numerically on what's going on. But if it's something that um, we know a lot about conceptually, we want to lean on that understanding. Now another criteria is that X2 and X1 are associated but, and it's an important one, X2 is not on the pathway. between x1 and y. 
And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. That we don't have something like this where x1 directly influences x2. And so x1 causes changes in x2, which then lead to the outcome. And x1 may or may not also independently affect the outcome. So again, this is looking at x1 directly affects x2, which then in turn affects the outcome. So this we call a mediation. Okay, and in a separate video, we'll talk a little bit about what it means for a variable to be um, a mediator. Okay, so let's think about it conceptually. Does it make sense that x2 and x1 are associated? I'd say in our data set, it does. Right? As children get older, they're more likely to smoke. Doesn't mean they're going to, but remember, this data set was kids aged 3 to 19. So as they become 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, as they're getting older, the likelihood of smoking is going to increase. Do we have something like this, where x1 directly causes uh, changes in x2? Does smoking affect your age? No, it doesn't, right? Smoking can't have a direct effect on your age. Smoking can't change your age. Okay, so we do have x1 and x2 being associated, but x2 is not on the pathway between them. Right? We don't have smoking affecting age, which then in turn affects the lung capacity. And then the final kind of numeric criteria, what you're going to see numerically, is that when you adjust, okay, or include, x2 in the model, b1 changes, if you don't know the notation, the triangle is uh, short for changes, b1 changes a lot. And putting quotes on there, keeping it subjective, right? We don't want to define a criteria of how much change is enough to call something a confounder. But right? again, we want to really lean on the concepts as it makes sense conceptually. Okay, but what we're going to see is when we in adjust for or include x2, the confounder in the model, this b1 coefficient, the coefficient for our variable of interest, is going to change a lot. And the standard error for b1 will not inflate. Okay, so the standard error for this B1, our variable of interest, it might stay the same, might go down a bit, might go up a little bit, but it's not going to increase a lot. Okay, again, um, a big increase is what we're going to think of as collinearity, or that's going to be one of the numeric indicators for, for collinearity. Okay, so what's happening with confounding is, remember, this here is going to be captured by B1 when we fit a model. Right? What effect does smoking have on the FEV? Now, if we do not, if we do not have age or X2 in the model, what happens? These two effects are confounded, right? Or you can think of them as being mixed together. Right? Age is not included in the model, but what's happening is age is affecting smoking, which then in turn affects FEV. Okay, so the age effect is going through here a bit. And the smoking effect is going to be a mixture of smoking and age. When we include age in the model, what happens is we now get the effect of age and the effect of smoking adjusted for age. Okay, removing the age confounding. Okay, so um, this is kind of the idea conceptually of what confounding is and what confounding looks like. I really want to stress the reminder here, the conceptual understanding is more important than just numerically what's happening, but looking at numerically how confounders behave can help, uh, help confirm confounders or help us explore the idea of confounding if... Uh, if we don't know what makes sense as much. So if it's a much newer area of research and we don't understand as well what confounders, uh, what variables should be confounders. So I just want to close by saying a few things. Where does knowledge of confounding come from? Right, so where does 
um, identifying which variables our confounders come from. Some of our knowledge can come from um, previous understanding or previous studies, right? So we might know from our previous knowledge that x2 should be associated with x1. Well, and I guess I want to take this moment to say something I forgot and I wanted to mention. One way we can think of um, confounding, okay, and it goes in line with point three, is that um, the distribution of x2 is different in the categories of x1. And then again, this is assuming x1 is categorical. Okay. So that's one way of thinking they're associated. Here, is the age distribution different for smokers and not smokers? And we can check that side-by-side -side box plots or other methods we've learned. Okay, so knowing which variables are potentially confounders can come from previous studies, previous knowledge, also knowledge of study design. Right, so I'd say, if we were looking at, say, people who are aged 30 to 50 in this study, um, would age and smoking be associated? I don't know for sure, but I think there'd be a much weaker association, right? There probably isn't much association between age and smoking in sort of a middle age range. But we know our study's looking at kids, right? Age three to 19. And we know based on that design, as they get older, they're gonna be more likely to smoke. Okay, so that kind of, knowing these are likely to be associated is coming from knowledge of the study design and the data itself. This one's important, so I'm gonna write it down. We want to include confounders in an effect size model regardless of statistical significance. Okay, so in this example, if we know age is a confounder, or it made sense conceptually, everything checked out, we're gonna include it in the model, even if age doesn't seem to be a statistically significant predictor of the outcome. If it made sense conceptually, we know it's a confounder, we put it in there. We're not worried about um, doing things like partial F test or R squareds or AIC and BIC and these sorts of things. Okay. And those are topics we have touched on and we're gonna to touch on them more um, in following lectures. But if something's a confounder, it goes in the model regardless of statistical significance. Um, <clears throat> I just wanna put a reminder that confounding is specific to um, individual variables. Right? So age may be a confounder of the smoking effect, but age may not be a confounder of the sex effect. Right, so calling something a confounder is in reference to a particular variable. And a reminder, confounding is specific to effect size models. If we're looking to predict an outcome, it doesn't really make sense to label a variable as a confounder, right, because confounders are specific to certain variables. If we're not gonna interpret the effect of certain variables, it makes no sense to refer to confounding. And the final thing I wanted to say was, we're gonna focus a lot in this course on addressing confounding through statistical adjustment, but it can be addressed at the study design stage, right? So we can do matching or um, restricted analysis or other approaches to try and address potential confounders when collecting the data. We're gonna focus a little bit more on the statistical side of things, not the design side of things. Once we have some data, if there's confounding, how can we try and um, address it and adjust for it in the modeling stage. Stick around guys, there's more to see and please stay safe.